Hello, everybody. Happy New Year, and welcome to Capital A, Unauthorized Opinions on Art and Money. I took a bit of a hiatus this election season. It was all a little bit too much for me, but I'm back now, and I'm really looking forward to putting out some new episodes about art, money, politics, and theory in 2021. To kickstart the new year, I wanted to sit down with my partner, Chilean American violist Georgina Rossi, and talk about her experience as a classical musician in today's economy. Classical musicians receive about as much training as Olympic athletes, and yet, even those of us who, like me, have been lovers of classical music since we were kids, might not have a very clear picture of how they earn their living and how the economy around them is structured until we've actually lived with one. I saw this interview as an opportunity to dig into these nuts and bolts because a lot of the challenges that classical musicians face touch on broader issues in the larger economy. We cover a lot of ground, starting with the basics. What is the training of a classical musician? How do you get an orchestra job? And what is the process of putting out a CD of music? From there, we speak more theoretically. How does society see or not see artistic labor, and what does that do to your interpersonal relationships, before winding it down with a few simple things that we as music lovers can do to support the musicians in our lives and those whose work we admire from afar. In this episode, I'm also really excited to be able to share with you a few excerpts from Georgina's new CD, Mobili, Music for Viola and Piano from Chile. I really love this record. It's a compilation of works from a range of Chilean classical composers active about 1960 to today, and it's a true work of art from the music to the album art all the way down to the program notes. Mobili was a collaboration with the amazing Sylvie Cheng, Canadian pianist, and it was put out by New Focus Recordings of New York. I'll have a link to it in the episode description. Georgina herself was born and raised in Santiago de Chile by classical musician parents, and her first teacher was her mother, violist Penelope Nuth. She received her bachelor's from the Manhattan School of Music and her master's from the Juilliard School. Okay, here it is. This is Capital A, Episode 12, What Do Musicians Do All Day? Georgina Rossi on the Microeconomics of Classical Music. So we're here to talk about music. Yeah. Yeah. That's the idea. So what do you want to know? Well, one of the subjects that I really want to cover with you here today is something that I've heard you talk a lot about, which is how we define work as a society and what that means for getting compensated, being empowered, feeling that you have the right to ask for things, demand things, and just live a decent life as a human being. But I want to start by just asking you something that I think very few people who are not classically trained musicians have much of a picture of, which is, what is the training of a classical musician? Right. Yeah. So I think people have this idea that you, you start really early and you learn how to play and it takes a very, very long time and it's very, very difficult. And then you go to conservatory and then you graduate and then you know how to play. And people wonder, like, I wonder what they do the rest of the day. Like, they really <laughs> do. Okay, so I think the key missing element from these, like, ideas of what classical musicians do all day is that we practice, like, every, like, every day. 
once you spend all those decades getting to know your instrument and finally getting competent enough and consistent enough to be relied upon in a concert setting, after that, you still, with very few exceptions, you still have to maintain that by, by a, a pretty consistent and difficult daily regimen of practice. How many years of schooling did you do before you got to this point? I started when I was four. My mom started me with daily lessons. That's really not uncommon. You have to start very early uh, in strings, especially. Those early years are really important for your teacher to lay out a rigorous and well-built technical foundation so that your future career will be built on really good technique. Good violin technique takes years, and those early years are really important, really foundational. So if your family didn't have the means or they didn't have a Suzuki program in their neighborhood or whatever the reason that you miss out on those earliest years from like four to eight, you're at a significant disadvantage later on in your career. Um, but you're not really practicing on your own ever because you're so little. So you're just getting like as many lessons as possible. You're getting like hands-on training. How old are you typically when you start to practice on your own and kind of take your practice into your own hands? Well, it's different for everybody. And this is where kind of the parent and the environment uh, is so important for a classical musician in training. And this is where, you know, less privileged kids have a much harder time because you need a lot of attention at that age because who can maintain the discipline of like a daily practice regimen, which you need very early on um, after school. No kid, want, very few kids want to do that. So but basically, as soon as, as soon as you're like cognizant, as soon as you can be taught that you need to do this every day, that's when you have to start doing this every day, practicing every day and getting a good technique routine up to speed and learning repertoire and building your chops. So up until a certain age, say middle school, you are doing weekly lessons and you're practicing either on your own or with the guidance of a teacher. That's right. I understand that your education also kind of went through a Chilean national system of some kind? Yes. Those are fantastic because music at an early age is very effective when it is community-based, which is something that the Suzuki program understands very well, and also something that nationalized orchestral and chamber music programs also understand very well. So this is all based on the Venezuelan El Sistema. In Chile, we had a wonderful program, too, called the FOGI, Fundación de Orquestas Juveniles Infantiles. So I got to be a part of a big symphony orchestra, a big like youth symphony orchestra when I was really young. And that means that you make friends there and you're all doing the same thing and you're learning the symphonic repertoire and you're falling in love with the repertoire at a really early age. How old were you? Um, 10 maybe, like around middle then. Middle school-ish. Yeah, middle school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Middle school. And then the next step is applying to your undergraduate, or is there something before that? If you're lucky, there is a pre-college that you can apply for, audition for, and get into that will provide you evening classes and um, performance training and chamber music and solo playing and orchestra, but also music theory, music history, harmony, things like that. So by the time that you're in high school, you're getting weekly lessons plus daily practice plus youth orchestra through the national program. Usually on weekends, yeah. <laughs> on weekends, plus an after-school pre-college program. That's like two nights a week, yeah. So it's a heavy burden on any teenager. How many hours a week is that? It's, it's a lot because the, I remember the evening programs. My pre-college was the Catholic University had a pre-college program for music. Um, it was three hours twice a week. And then on top of that, there's the orchestral program, which was twice a week, once on a weekend, and once on a weekday. Okay. And then on so top of that, there so was that's my like yeah. twelve hours right there. Yeah, and then on top of that, there was daily, uh, weekly lesson and my supposed daily practice, which I kept up as best <laughs> I could. But you know, it was hard. So we're talking about twenty hours ish. <laughs> yes, it's hard. Yeah, it's every a lot. week. Every week. On top of regular school. Work. Right. And then. And then senior year high school, you spend pretty much all of that senior year <laughs> auditioning uh, for. Uh, an undergraduate program. There's so many young musicians now. The world is so big. There's so many people in it that everything is so much more competitive. So there's a pre-screening round first. And I mentioned that because it, it's important because that pre-screening round is not easy. 
Um, it's just, it takes a lot of work to prepare those recordings for the pre-screening round. It's not like you can just tape whatever you want and send it. It has to be as professional a recording as you can get it to be, which is costly. And it's hard for a 17 year old to figure that out. Mm -hmm. You need help, you need resources. Mm -hmm. You have to learn specific rep for each institution a lot of the time. Sometimes there's overlap, blessedly. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time, it's just just different enough that it's more hours in the recording studio, more hours figuring out how to record a professional mm -hmm. sounding tape. And, um, and more you're paying ways, for that, you're of paying, course. Well, I mean, a lot of people don't. You know, not everybody can pay for it. So unfortunately, that comes through in the recording. You know, you can tell right away when somebody didn't have a quiet place to record, mm -hmm. um, the sound insulation, and when their instrument sounds distorted, or whether they were able to edit out, like the, if they're putting on the mic themselves and they're moving around, grabbing their instrument, like all those things, people who can are able to produce a more professional recording. And, and, and that's unfortunately the truth. Mm -hmm. but, There's the pre screening and then the and audition. Then, and then the live out. If you get past it, um, you get to travel to the uh, college in person, to the conservatory or the university in person, and give a live audition. You have to get a leave from your school and you fly all over the country and take, most people take like three auditions. Or maybe, I don't know, kids, what, what people are doing these days. When, when I was in high school, the, st the norm was like four auditions. Some people took like seven or eight or nine or 10, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. You know, you have to pay for, you have to pay for all of them, not to mention you have to pay for the flights yourself and the accommodation yourself. Um, and not to mention, this is around the time where it's really important that you have an instrument that's going to match your level. Because at that level, you know, you're auditioning for college, you're pretty advanced, playing real repertoire, they're going to notice if you're playing a cheap instrument. This is around the time when people start getting an instrument at around the $25,000 range. The lower end of a professional violin, for example, is it, the, the lower end pushing it down is, is like... $18,000. Most people play a uh, $35,000 instrument and um, people with huge careers pay a lot more money for their instruments going up into the hundreds of thousands. And so a lot of my peers at 17 years old had incredibly expensive equipment. The bow alone can set you back $10,000, $15,000 easily for a good bow and it makes an enormous difference. So you better have some well-to-do parents there to pick you up at 17 years old. And then you repeat the process. Then you repeat the process on your, on your senior year, same timeline, senior year of undergraduate. I don't know a lot of people who took a break after undergrad because it's very like moment, music is very momentum based. So you want to get a job as quickly as you can. You want to get your degrees as quickly as you can. Uh, it doesn't help you at all to take a break. So yeah, senior year of undergrad, Pre-screenings in the fall are due, and then live auditions January and February, and that's that. So you have to you have to work in your schoolwork both times. I think a lot of people don't realize that being an orchestra musician is a job. It's something that people get paid to do. You get paid a lot of money in a lot of cases. So I know that you did one tour of orchestral auditions. Yeah. Just as you got out of your master's. Right. What was that like? Can so you paint that picture for I did us? one tour once I was out of school. I had my part-time job at Hartford Symphony. Then I took uh, a real audition tour, the only one I've ever taken mm -hmm. uh, in terms of professional orchestral auditions mm -hmm. um, in Europe. And I packed as many auditions as I could into one, one trip because obviously that's the cheapest way to do it. Um, and it was really – I remember it being – pretty brutal and I was prepared I didn't I felt like I played well everywhere I didn't win any of the jobs which is, I didn't expect to like it's it's one in a million to really win these positions I was going after really 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 coveted positions in Europe with wonderful wonderful musicians and beautiful venues as beautiful stages and just it, these positions would lead to a really excellent life and there are very few of these and they're hard to win so I didn't expect to win anything but that's how it is. Um, but it was brutal because I was, the isolation was really hard for me. And I think it's really hard for a lot of musicians. And the sense that you're investing so much money and time and energy, you know, you're 
practicing like a maniac before you even take off, of course, to prepare. And then you get there and you're in a different time zone and you're alone and you're in a shitty, you're in some horrible hotel because that's what you can afford. And you're practicing like crazy leading up to like the instant of your uh, your actual audition where you're just like, what's the expression like a one in like a pig, like one pig among many where you're called like you're number 75 or whatever. <laughs> and it's it's not a nice atmosphere when you walk into the these audition waiting rooms. You don't always get your private room. Usually it's like one big room where everyone who is auditioning for the same job is practicing and it's this c- horrible cacophony and Fish. this big echoey room and everyone is shredding on their instruments. Pract- the, the nervous energy, can you imagine? It's like... One big room, everyone practicing the same excerpts because it's the same repertoire for that particular audition, obviously. And you just hear everybody going over this rep, like making mistakes that you hope to avoid. And it's, it's, you, you know exactly what everybody, however many people are in that room with you, whether it's 70 people or sometimes way more than 70 people, like you know exactly what they're doing and you know their anxieties because their anxieties are your anxieties. And then, you know, you audition for it. You There's many rounds in auditions. You either don't get past the first round. Once you play the first round, you wait around in that horrible room. <laughs> and you can't stop practicing because you might be in the second round. You just don't know that yet. So you have to keep practicing and keep, keep stretching and keeping your body feeling as best as you can. You wait around for them to come out and call, you know, either post it on the wall or call who passed on to the second round. And then there's a third round, sometimes a fourth round. I was there, it was, they did it all in one day and they did a surprise fourth round. God. I had put my instrument away. Oh God. I was like, okay, whatever happens now, there were only like, I don't remember how many of us had passed all the rounds. Of the, there was like four of us waiting, feeling horrible. You can imagine like we had seen everybody leave. <laughs> you know, it was horrible. And at that point, you know, there's like, there, there were three openings. So I remember there were like four of us or something so ridiculous. one of you We knew one of us, it was like some the worst possible competition reality show <laughs> um but yeah they i had put away my instrument i remember that so vividly it was raining it was pouring so i couldn't even leave the building because it was like if i left the building i would get poured on so i <laughs> i stayed inside i there i had no food with me it's not like they serve sandwiches like there's nothing like you're there you better have your supplies your instrument better be in good shape if you need anything you can't get it like that's it most of the time but yeah i had put my instrument away and i was like I was like, no matter what happens now, at least like I'm done all of that prep and all of that energy and all of that work. I'm done now. I did my final round. I played. I did. It it, it is what it is. And then I was like, okay, I hope they just call it. I hope they call it. I hope they call it just ASAP because I want to get the hell out of here. I don't know. I remember I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get home. I missed the last bus home. I remember. And the last train home too. It was like midnight. And then... (laughs) And then they come out and we're all like, okay, who's who, who won the job? And they're like, they can't decide, so we're going to do one more round. I was like, I, there's no way. I was like, I had to start like warming up again. God. It was insanity. At midnight. Yeah, it was like 11.30 p.m. or something. And we had been there since like 10 in the morning. Oof. Crazy, right? Anyway. <laughs> so that's what, so yeah, it's, it's not fun to drop everything and, and pour all this money to fly to Europe on, you know, on my, on my mother's with my mom footing the bill, who my mom is also a working musician, like people who are not in the music business or are not in the arts business, they just have no idea. They're like, well, but like you fly all the way there. Okay. It's a huge investment, but like, you'll get the job. No, you won't. Like there's like (laughs) 45,000 other people who want the same job. It's really hard. Okay. So here you are, you've spent, I don't know, what is it at this point, 22, 23 years training on this instrument to get to where you are, which is not yet a person that can pull a living wage off of their (laughs) instrument. That's correct. I don't say that as a, as a, as a slight, that's, that's a condemnation of the, of the economy that artists have to survive in. After all that schooling, after all those auditions, you have a part-time orchestra job, which still does not make ends meet for you. Are there other things that you could put your musical education to that could pay your bills? There are things. Um, People outside of the music industry often talk to young musicians who, who express these difficulties and these struggles as young musicians um, with this kind of note of 
sweet, well-meaning, wise and condescension. And they say things like, well, you know, it's really tough, but you got to find ways to make ends meet. You can teach a young kid, you can build up a, a teaching studio, you can, um, you can gig as much as you can, like you can do like Zoom lessons all day or they always have ideas for, oh, well, you know, it's hard, but there are all these things you could be doing. You could be, that you could be putting out videos of popular, mm -hmm. popular songs and build up your online audience. I think it's really important to say, if you do do that, you are investing your time mm -hmm. into something that you aren't, that you did not train to be. Mm -hmm. So that's important. Like you can do those things. That's an option. But for many people, it's just, they trained and are passionate about something completely different. Right. If I had a busy teaching schedule, I don't feel like I would have been able to to put out the CD, at least not in the way that I did, mm -hmm. not not as well. Um, and if I had a part time job, it, it just no, it would not have been the same. You cannot hold like a day job and become a right. professional musician. Right. The reason I was able to put it out is because I was able to work on it full time. You recently did what I understand most of your peers have not done, which is put out an album, a CD of work. Why don't you walk us a little bit through the process of creating that CD? First of all, who funded it? The CD was funded through crowdfunding. It took a lot of time to make a, like, beautifully presented, you know, a well-presented proposal is what it is. It's a proposal because you're trying to get people to open their pocketbook and say, yeah, you should do this work. Let right. me help you fund it. And you're not practicing while you're doing that. Nope. You're making nope. videos, yeah. writing text, reaching out to people, putting together contact That's lists. That's right. That's right. You're networking. You are contacting people. You are making sure that you are writing which is a skill that a lot of musicians do not have. And luckily I do have that skill and that's really important and has been a huge asset for me. So you put all of this effort and energy into a Kickstarter campaign, which was luckily successful yes. because most of them are not. Um, it didn't fully fund it. I have to admit there was more money involved as how, usual. How, but how, how, how much of your own money Oh my God. Did you had to put in on top of that? A lot. Um, I would say like at least 8000 extra dollars to 10000 And why do you have that much money lying around? I do not have that much money lying around. My parents, both of them classical musicians, have some money. Um, they are, you know, they've worked their entire lives. My father does not have any inherited family money. My mother does. Both of them have helped me. So e even with a successful Kickstarter campaign yes. to fund this process, you would not have been able to do it. I would have. This is really interesting, and I'm really glad that you asked. In theory, I would have I would have been able to, to squeak it through um, with just the recording sessions. But let's not forget that on top of the recording sessions and the hourly rate of the engineer, the engineer is there with you when you're recording, of course, um, you also have to pay for all the hours that your engineer spent alone editing your work or with you editing your work. 
What that extra padding bought me is really significant. It bought me the ability to be able to bring my complete vision to life in a professional way. Editing is expensive mm -hmm. and it is nowadays, it is necessary in classical music and in any genre. Everything that you listen to is highly edited. And you can debate that all day, whether or not it's a good thing. It's, I think we've shot ourselves, as my engineer said, we've shot ourselves in the foot because music is not supposed to be perfect. Mm -hmm. It's not that I was that insecure about my playing, but a lot of the editing has to do with balance and acoustics. Mm -hmm. So a huge part of it was about the actual, it's not so much about our chops, it's more about the impression that the audio leaves on mm -hmm. the listener. And is it an impression of expansive luxury and of, of well-balanced acoustics? Those things, that what makes a, a professional classical CD sound professional is those wonderful acoustics. And I had to pay for that. And I will say my incredible engineer, Ryan Straber, um, is a musician. He's a composer. He went to Juilliard. He studied with Milton Babbitt. Like he's a remarkably intelligent person and, you know, a, a, a wonderful musician. And he loved the music and he was able to really interpret it and really help it shine. Um but that's yeah. only because... That's only because I could pay him. Most people would not have been able to, to, to stretch that and they would have produced an album that was like self-produced, you know, self-distributed, like, you know, without any any help. You need help to make something. It, it really does take and, a village. And, and, this is hard. And frankly, the sad truth is it probably wouldn't get heard. It wouldn't get heard. It wouldn't be appreciated Irrespective of how good the playing on that self-distributed... Oh, yeah. We're not talking about yeah. the playing at right. all. Right. We're just talking about the 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 capital the that it takes it, yeah. to put out an album even if you're an incredible musician if you don't have that capital right. no matter what your right. playing is like right what you put out is not going to sound professional quote unquote because or of look the, professional or look or, professional or, or get distributed in a yeah. professional way or frankly get put in front of people that could give it value that's right that's right and that's just yeah it's not the way it should be it's not right um, I'm working with an independent, wonderful cooperative label called New Focus Recordings. They're based in New York City. The owner is just this incredible musician. He's a guitar player. His name is Dan Lipple. He's wonderful. He's wonderful to work with. And his team is really, really artist oriented because they're a small label and they're, it's, they're trying to put out records that they care about, that they that they believe need to be out and heard in the world. You can read their mission statement online and I just jived with it immediately as soon as I read it and that's when I reached out to them. I was like, I wonder if they'd be interested um, in the CD. I could have released my CD independently, but power in numbers, like when you partner up with other artists, an incredible thing happens. Mm. People suddenly, not only are other artists able to do something for you, for example, New Focus Recordings was able to add me to their catalog, which partners me with so many other beautifully presented recordings and, and legitimizes my work. Mm -hmm. um, but he, in his work as a label owner, is to produce records and, def and, and put them out in the postmodern landscape that we all live in. Mm -hmm. Because it is not easy, actually, to, be, to get your work on Spotify, to get your work on... Amazon, like all these horrible corporations that take our work and sell them. Once it's out there, once it's on the yeah. platforms, once there's a label behind it, how do you get people to hear it? Right. So a lot of this is a gimbal. I mean, that was my biggest anxiety and my, not anxiety, but my biggest sadness in putting out this incredibly like labor intensive, you know, piece of work. It took me so long to get to a place where I could put something like that out there. And I knew, I felt like I knew a month before the release date that people were not going to have the bandwidth to listen to it, mm -hmm. um, that there was the elect the United States election going on. There was a global pandemic um, and people were just like, yeah. I was so sure that it was going to be buried yeah, buried. I, I, th I think a lot of artists yeah. feel that anxiety. It's it's uh, not even anxiety. Sometimes it it's feels, a deep. For me, it was a, it was a very real sadness. For me, it feels like um, uh, an unwarranted indulgence. Why would you add more noise to this soup? That's really interesting that you say that because it actually I'm very proud to say that it never felt that way to me. Yeah, and I think that's that's a sign of growth for me. I mean, everybody has their own process and. Um, 
in no way am I saying that you haven't grown it. <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a man child. I <laughs> scratch myself in public. And and you record your wonderful podcast, which you also are sad when, when you know you feel like no one's going to listen to it, which isn't true, by the way. It is part of it is an illusion. People do listen to your work and they will, they have listened to my CD. I can now say a month after having put it out. Ultimately, it's out of my control. Are people going to hear this or not? People do not. It is true. They do not have the bandwidth. Um, and that that is a very sad and painful thing. You know, that's hard. But yeah, that's I, okay. I, I feel like there's a lot of... Um, we all want people to look at our work, but we don't necessarily spend the time to look that's at right. other people's work. And that's so right. we're all kind of... It becomes masturbatory very quickly. That's really that's exactly right, and I, that's really hard. And I'm I've been hyper aware of this for so long. The only yeah. thing you can do is to treat, to double down on your treatment of others. Yeah, to yeah. treat other people's work with, with what you hope yeah. people will give your work. With. That's right, and I'm I've only like released a CD. It's only been out for a month, but I have planned a like a whole like deep dive into because new folks recordings puts, puts out a lot of records and i've listened to a lot as many as i can but even for me i'm like oh my god i can't it's too much so i right. i have a very limited platform god knows i'm not an influencer but i can uh spend a couple weeks listening to records and try to highlight all the ones that i love and put them out there and, sh and share them so that's going to be from be the new focus from catalog. the new focus catalog just because i appreciate new focus so much but also because i know now what it, it's like to mm -hmm. put something out there so i want to use my teeny tiny platform to be like hey these are all my favorite records that are not my own mm -hmm. uh from this wonderful wonderful catalog like and just just email them to my friends and be like you should listen to this that's, it's amazing i think that's a wonderful thing i wish yeah. people spent more time doing that yeah. I, I i i think it would be real it would be a better world it would be <laughs> it would be We're talking to Chilean-American violist Georgina Rossi about her experience as a classical musician in today's economy. In the second half, we're going to speak a bit more theoretically about how society values artistic labor, the emotional landscape and class structure that creates, and some practical things that you or I as music lovers can do to support the musicians that we love. If you're drinking to your coffee, now might be a good time for a refill. Here is the second half of my interview with violist Georgina Rossi. It sounds like the incredible expense of all those years of schooling, the employment opportunities you had to pass up because you had to practice every day, the plane tickets and hotel rooms you had to book just to audition for jobs, and of course, the inordinate investment of recording, producing your own CD. All of that sounds like a pretty formidable class barrier. In your experience does classical music as a as an industry or as a career select for people with privileged backgrounds or would you say that it's still a fairly meritocratic industry in the sense that like talent and hard work is still most important it doesn't feel to me like a meritocracy at all um 
It depends on where you are in the world, I think, when it comes to classical music. Where I grew up in Santiago, there was significant funding for the arts, and there were orchestral models based on the one in Venezuela that is so famous and successful called El Sistema, which whose goal it was to draw talent and merit and hard work from underprivileged communities. There were a lot of kids, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, who came into classical music in Chile that I knew. Most of my peers were very poor, mm -hmm. if I'm being honest. Mm. And that is an excellent thing because they were just as talented as people mm -hmm. who were in the upper brackets. So most of them did very well, whether or not they went into music. It was a huge way to draw that, to give them cultural capital, mm -hmm. to give them a background that was going to help them in whatever field they ended up choosing to focus on. Um, but a lot of, a significant amount of them went into classical music, are working as classical musicians, are doing very well. Like this is really, it's a really important thing to do. I don't see that happening here. Everybody that I met as soon as I came into the United States at 16, almost everybody was from a very privileged community. Um, it became clear very quickly that, that I was surrounded by rich people. Mm -hmm. An extension of that is, of course, that society is passing on so much potential musical talent by just not even giving people from more humble backgrounds a shot at competing for a career in this field. I mean, yeah, it's funny to talk about this because I'm thinking, yes, they're not. The United States is not giving poor or even like, let's be real, even middle class, like like most people are bracketed out of these fields of dance, of professional dance, of professional music. Um yeah, the United States is not giving these people a chance in the arts. But, like, they're also not giving them a chance at anything else in life. Like, yeah. these right. people are bracketed out of everything. Right. Yeah, yeah, they can't play violin for a living. They also can't do anything right. else they other than work. They can't take an unpaid they internship, They can work for, for CBS. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's about it. From the way I see it, that is the piece of the pie that they're getting. It's really anyone who says different, anyone who says, oh, you can become anything in America – that is a thing of the long gone past. <laughs> the way that I see it, I cannot see how you would climb up sufficiently because there's just corporations all the way down. Like you just can't escape it. What it comes down to in a really unfair economy is the more you want a career, the more you're supposed to invest in it. Yeah. And right. this funding that you're supposed to have to invest in your field and your career Let's be real. It's not like it used to be in even just like the 70s where artists could invest their time. Right. Even if they had nothing else, they could invest their time right. and they could scrape by on cheap rent mm -hmm. in New York where they wanted to be. They could. They had community. They had other people that they looked to. Even if they didn't have schooling, they had other artists that they looked to for, for, for an education. They had... They had the basics of what they needed to, and to make what, what investments they could. There was an article that came out on August 7th of this year in Vice, which breaks down how much digital streaming platforms like Spotify pay their artists. Quote, Spotify pays artists approximately $0.00437 per stream. Tidal and iTunes pay a fraction more, Amazon Music a fraction less. This means that artists would need around 360,000 streams per month to earn minimum wage, end quote. After this lifelong journey that you've taken, 20 years of physically demanding training and schooling, two years of fundraising, rehearsal, and producing your own CD, how much do you expect to be getting paid for releasing this album? A negligible amount. It's, I went into it knowing that it was an investment and a feather in my cap and, you know, primarily something that I really wanted to do, a, labor, a real labor of love that I thought was really important. But I, I don't expect, I mean, my label's not going to make any money. I'm not going to make any money. Like this is all, we're all like doing all this charity work basically uh, to society. And that's the sad truth about art is that people are going to do their work, whether or not they are compensated fairly for it. 
So yeah, um, I'll, I'll be really surprised if it covers a grocery bill. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go into it hoping to make money. I mean, that would have been delusional. But it, I do think that it's fair for us to envision a world where we are compensated fairly for our work. Like, And it's funny because people don't... Artists and musicians, I don't hear them talking about this at all. And if you do talk about it, people kind of look at you like it's considered in poor taste. Yeah. Like, oh, you want to get paid? Yes, I would like very much to get paid for my work. It would be really nice because then I would have not only my own self-motivation for continuing to work really hard for nothing, but an external factor that permits me to feel like I've earned my keep and that I've earned my right to, to, to take up a little space in the world and that I'm not just pushing this on people right yeah I, I think for many artists or maybe the majority of artists money just means something a little bit different right, right. It, it it probably is not an investment for you to get rich off of money means things like validation security time to make your work yeah and I think what you point to about like the right to take up space in the world is very key. Like yeah. when you do all of this free work, when you're constantly being asked to invest in yourself right. in the absence of any kind of investment coming from the outside world, what you feel like is that there is no space for you. Right. And of course, it's not true because as you point out, like classical music has been around for several centuries at this point. <laughs> And people continue miraculously to enjoy it somehow while, you know, the same cannot be said necessarily of all the products that people create, right. which make a buck in this world. So I think the the emotional landscape of being asked to fund yourself is, is misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard. Earlier this year, Daniel Ek, the CEO of Spotify, was quoted saying essentially that the problem is not with Spotify's payout scheme, but that we have entered a new age where, quote, some artists that used to do well in the past may not do well in this future landscape. You can't record music once every three to four years and think that's going to be enough, end quote. What is your response to Mr. X's vision of the future landscape of music? What an incredible incredibly moronic thing to say in 2020. He's, what is he? He's a billionaire, right? Four billion. Yeah. It is so stupid that we have to spend our time thinking about the stupid things that billionaires say. Um, and it, their thoughts are not worth our time. Like the only that's thing right. worth our time is yeah. figuring out how to strip them of their fucking billions. Like that's how I feel about them. Give them a living wage. <laughs> 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 that's what I think they need. But anyway, this is a man who just has not a clue what goes into making a record. This does bring me back to Mackenzie work a little bit. I've been really, I've been getting a lot out of her book. This is, this is really interesting. She talks about this post-capitalist world. Since we're living in this kind of new age that is dictated not by owning the means of production, but by owning the vectors of information. It's this all, this whole, the whole landscape we live in, the whole economy is based on information. The platforms of distributing information. Right. So she says, and I'm just going to read, um, she says, it has to do with the whole problem of exchange value in an age where the forces of production are extensively and intensively controlled by information. Nobody knows what anything is worth. Mm -hmm. Daniel Ock doesn't know what my work is worth. He doesn't know what his work is worth. Nobody knows what anybody's work is worth anymore. Mm -hmm. So what does he choose to do? He chooses to take the largest piece of the pie because nobody knows what anything is worth anymore and just make up this as Greta Thunberg would say fairy tale mm -hmm. about supply and demand in music that makes no sense in the landscape of music or art why not because that's not the way art works there is never going to be the right amount of demand to the right of, amount of supply for art that's not what art is art isn't toilet paper <laughs> It's like <laughs> most art is not toilet paper. Most. <laughs> yeah, I would love nothing more than to produce one CD per year. But like, it is it is it is outrageously expensive to fund that work without taking into account my and my pianist's paychecks, which we just disregard basically. Yeah. So who's gonna fund it? He's saying that I'm supposed to already have right. the money that I need to fund my own 
music for years and years and years and years and years until I get famous enough that all of the streams right. add up to some kind of a living wage. None of this makes any sense. That's not how music works. <laughs> like it will never be how music works. He's right. There will never be that kind of demand for my music and that's fine. Right. We should compensate it anyway. Right. That doesn't like, mean there's no place for it in right, the world. Right. Right. I mean, because if going by what he's saying, we should only compensate the, like whatever the hits are, then we should only pay those musicians. Right. Those are the people who get those hits. Who is it these days? I don't even know. It's like Billie Eilish and like, that's it. Um, and, you know, I would like to say that there are alternatives. Like, it's not perfect, but Bandcamp is a much better place to go listen to your music. They align themselves with the success of the artist. So they they genuinely do. They have a fair, what they call a fair trade music policy. So you, you get a much fairer chunk of the streaming profits as an artist. Throughout um, this horrible pandemic that we're all experiencing, they have been waiving their profits on Friday to give 100% of it to artists. That's incredible. Every Friday. Like, That's they start incredible. this every couple of months. They're like, from now until the end of the month, we're going to waive all our profits on Friday. Like, yeah. it's crazy. I think that really drives home something yeah. really important, which is the trick nowadays is to talk about these changes that make your life so much harder as if they are inevitable. As if it, well, right. that's just what the economy is right. doing. Right, people love to say that. Like this is this is the reality of the economy nowadays. Whereas in fact, all of these are choices they that people choices. have made. Bandcamp has made a different set of right. choices. Right. And you know, platforms like Spotify could afford to make those choices. Of course as well. they could. <laughs> like it's a billionaire. Of course they could afford to make different choices. So. This leads us back to where we started this conversation, which is how we as a society define work. First off, because making art is commonly thought of as a pleasurable activity in and of itself, right. people for some reason feel comfortable asking artists to submit work for free. Yeah, they really do. Right? No one would ever think of asking a lawyer or an accountant to work for free because those activities are not assumed to be pleasurable. Right. But artists get hit up for free work all the friggin' time. Yeah. And I'm not even, right. you know, I'm not even talking about photographing your work, writing artist statements, submitting residency applications, all of this administrative labor. What I call office work. Office work. <laughs> Which that, takes up most of my time. Nobody believes me, but like most of what I do is I, sit in front of a computer. Yeah. And this is stuff that artists did not used to have to do. Right. In the last like three or four decades, as all of this money has been pumped into the art market, there's been this entire professional ecosystem that developed around making money off of artists like MFA programs, paid residencies, renting out booths at art fairs, selling services mm -hmm. to artists, etc. All of this is people providing quote unquote professional services, which get compensated as professional services yeah. do. And as an artist, it can sometimes feel like you're the only one actually producing something in this mm -hmm. economy. Yeah. And yet somehow you're the only one not getting not paid. Not getting paid. Yeah. On the subject of pleasurable work, mm -hmm. this is so endlessly interesting because people get tied up in knots when they talk about it. Um, it is true. Many people turn to the arts for pleasure and it can be intensely pleasant, pleasurable work. Um, but let us look at it a different way. It comes down to whether or not you believe that work should be paid. Like whether, if you add disclaimers to that, then we need to investigate that. Like, do you believe in paying people for their work? Period. Period. Like that's all it should be. Paying them fairly. Cooking is something right. that is very pleasurable right. for many people. And many people turn to it for nothing but pleasure. Right. But would you then say that your caterer should Didn't really do it for free because right. she loves cooking? Right. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Not only was a catering gig not probably very fun for her, but it involved logistics that do right. not go into cooking for pleasure. Right. Basic, like, logistics, the things that take all of the joy out of an otherwise, otherwise joyous experience are going to be present in art too. 
if you have to, if you are trying to live off of your art and you have given it your life, there are going to be logistics involved. And we deserve to be paid in general because we are doing it in, we're doing it in the realm of work, not necessarily pleasure. So like, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Everybody deserves to be paid fairly for their work. And that includes artists and people who are working for nothing in this field, in classical music, people who are spending all of their time and money that they don't have. It's just, no one's supporting these young people. No one is supporting these young people who are spending all their money um, on degrees to in America to then try and fly around the planet trying to get a job and practicing the whole time and they're not getting anything for it. And it's, it's really hard. How do you think the dynamics that we discussed today affect your interpersonal relationships, both with other musicians that are your peers and with people who are non-musicians in your life? Uh, um, this is the saddest part of it all is I, I think that it really, the way that the market is structured toward when it comes to everybody, but especially artists and musicians, um, it really degrades the relationships that we that we have with each other. It makes it feel like we are in direct competition with each other, which is not really always true, but it feels that way regardless. Um, and when you are stressed and stretched so thin, you don't have um, you don't have a full cup to be kind to be a kind, generous person. I think there are so many people who have falling outs with each other over jealousy, over, you know, careerism and misunderstandings. And the result of all of this is that we feel more and more alone every day. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working alone a lot of the time as musicians, unlike, for example, dancers who like go to rehearsal every day and, like dancers don't ever pretend to be able to do their work alone. And I'm, I'm very jealous of that. And I'm very like, I admire that practice a lot because bec it becomes really difficult when you don't have the communities that you need to keep you going in your social life and in your work life. And, and when those communities that you do have are constantly being overshadowed by the specter of networking, like All you have time. to monetize yeah. every relationship. That's you right. You constantly have yeah. to promote yourself to your friends, to your relations, to right. your family. It's really sad. Yes, I think that's exactly right. I think that's what happens. My last question is, is there anything you would like to say to non-musicians out there who maybe have a musician in their life that they would know that, that they would like to know how to support better or maybe just to people who consider themselves lovers of music and want to be ethical consumers. Like what advice do you have out there for those of us that would like to support musicians better? I mean, I, my first statement would be do not feel like this is on you because it's not like mm -hmm. I, I very firmly, I hate that all these kinds of conversations always conclude with, well, you know, be sure to support public radio right. or like, no, right. no, we should have public funding for the arts. 
in a more robust way than we have now. Like what we have now is kind of a joke. Um, it should not be on you to pay all the artists yes. um, personally. That said, if you do really want to, if you're consuming music anyway and you want to do it a little more carefully, several things you can do. First of all, in-person live work, once it's available again, is really important to musicians and to freelancers. This is where we make, this is like the difference between a good month and a bad month is whether or not we have a gig. Mm -hmm. So hire them, hire them in person. Do not get a stereo for your wedding, except maybe if you want to like a dance party at night, but like consider hiring musicians. It's very easy. It's ch way cheaper than it should be. So it's mm -hmm. not like it's a big investment. Um, if you're wondering about where to go to hire a musician, well, again, it's not hard. Uh, you can go to, I actually really do support going through Juilliard if you're in New York or in the tri-state area. Juilliard was the first place that bothered to educate me in any way mm. on how to on how to draft a contract, on how to demand fair pay, on how much your hourly rate should be, on how to look out for yourself on the gig, what to ask for, what like what disclaimers to add into your contract language so that you are not, for example, forced to play outside in the rain. Mm -hmm. uh, basic basic things like that. Juilliard was the only ones. And they, their rates are their rates are fairer than most. So I would go through them. The pro program is called Hire Juilliard Performers. Um, in terms of streaming, opt for Bandcamp. Um, buy records. Don't go, don't buy them through iTunes. If you buy a record through iTunes, if you if you stream it on Spotify, if you buy it on Amazon, the artist is getting nothing for that. And, you know, it's not like they're expecting to get anything anyway. So, you know, it's, okay. it's not the end of the world. Do whatever you can. We all opt into convenience. We all order on Amazon. Like, I understand. But Bandcamp is fairer. Um, <clears throat> it's fun to go through Bandcamp and support the labels that you want and discover good music that you really enjoy without it, like, being forced down your throat as, like, some kind of a chill mood playlist. So yeah, look, look through, sift through Bandcamp, find what you like, and buy the records. And that's a great, it's a much fairer way to support musicians. And finally, don't forget to go to concerts. I mean, tickets, like, the cheapest tickets in Carnegie Hall sound just as good as the most expensive ones. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. Um, I think most people are just thinking about, like, how to stream better or how to, like, make better choices. But if people are looking to, like, give, put their money somewhere, I would say maybe avoid the obvious choices. Like, avoid, like, uh, like a big old name that might end up in the hands of administrative fees. Try to avoid throwing your money somewhere just because you know the name of it. Instead, again, I hate that everything falls on the individual, but if you are going to put your money somewhere in music, do your research and try to end up assisting smaller organizations way I'm thinking way smaller tiny musical organizations that do really important work that pick up the slack the work that bigger names like Lincoln Center aren't doing mm -hmm. um so look at what they are needing right now they get like they scrape by and all they do is support their local artists they build community they could use help they yeah. could use financial help look smaller don't just throw your money at Lincoln Center um Try to try to seek out people that you trust are doing good work. And especially if those people are enabling other people to do their best work yeah. and fund them. Maybe if you have a few examples, I can put them in the, yeah. the, uh, yeah. the notes for this for this episode. Yeah, that would be really great. So we'll, we'll have some of that yeah. um, in the notes for this episode. What about just emotionally or interpersonally? How would you recommend that people... On a day-to-day -day level, as a friend or as a family member, support the musicians in their lives. Um, I think a lot of musicians have a lot of trouble making friends with people who are outside of their field. So if you are friends with a classical musician, ask them how their day is. Like, it's okay that you don't know what they do all day. Do not assume that they do nothing all day. Mm -hmm. Treat them with respect ask them how their work is going. You know, it means the world to me yeah. when people outside of my field who don't know me very well, but are trying to be polite in the best possible way, when they say, how's your music going? Yeah. 
I know that they're not experts in classical music and that's fine. But the fact that they're saying, hey, how's your music going? That tells me so many beautiful things. It means that they know that I'm working on it all day. It means that even though they don't know a lot about it, they're curious and they and they want to know like how I'm doing and how the work is going. It's like, it's so respectful. And that is so rare. Like there are only less than a handful of people say, hey, how's your music going? Most people just don't say anything. They, they'll resort to like, well, how are you doing these days? If you do not know what they do all day, if you do not know what your musician friend or your artist friend does all day, um, ask them about it. Ask them, ask them what they're up to, what their projects are looking like, who they're working with, um, what music they're working on. Like, and you know, I'm not saying we always have to talk about work all the time. I don't like that either, but it's very, it's plainly obvious when people don't know what I do and would rather just pretend like I do nothing. And then the conver that makes the conversation really sour really fast, uh, especially when we're talking about what other people do all day, like their office jobs or whatever it is. Don't leave people out of the conversation, you know? Be polite. Be nice. I think it's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on to my podcast and sharing your experiences. Um, and thank you for the incredible work that you do. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What a pleasure. <laughs>